Hey everybody, welcome back to the Combat Chain. I'm your host, Pat. I'm not good until I've been punched four times in the face, then I'll block for five, Shaw. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Adam. Do I block for three or block for two? Philip Chuck. Adam, how are we doing today? We're doing great, Pat. Uh, excited to be here. I'm wondering why, of all the spoilers, I got the Guardian reference. I have never been known to be a Guardian player. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I'll, uh, full transparency, low-hanging fruit. It was there, it was on the tip of my, tip of my tongue, tip of my mind, and that's, that's what you got. Uh, so, <laughs> as I get better at fun nicknames uh for for ourselves uh you'll get you'll get more and more nuanced philip chuck references uh as as i go well we are coming hot off the heels of our goliath gauntlet preview special with uh friends of the channel the flesh and pod podcast crew and tommy fresh of the fresh and buds go check out that video it was a lot of fun to to record with everybody we we seeded the entire tournament we broke down all the matches western eastern conferences we picked winners uh a lot of potential for upsets and those matches start on this friday the 14th on 93 media so follow them on youtube and twitter and of course follow us and subscribe so you can watch that video and get all the information you need uh, about that tournament um but i digress we have a special guest this week. We have the lazy dog himself. Frank Hung is with us on the podcast today. If you play Flesh and Blood, you know exactly who it is because we all know Frank. And Frank knows everybody. He is the single degree of separation that separates all Flesh and Blood players around the world. He rose to public prominence uh, from casting the Canadian Nationals, but we've all been friends for a very long time. Frank, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Pat. I'm uh, definitely here to farm a little bit more clout. Um, and Adam, farm thanks. Clout. thanks. I, I think why you got the Guardian preview card is because I uh, I called dibs on the, the Rune Boyd one. So, uh, you know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I like to save up some uh, some purple pills until until I pop them all. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is, is that a, a, a child or a family friendly comment to make for your podcast? <laughs> yeah, we are. We are an adult friendly program here. By all means, uh, be be who you want to be and say what you want to say here. Um, but, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, it's it's fun to finally actually kind of sit down. Oh, we've, I feel like we've, we've all talked a bit on, you know, discord and online and, you know, we all have known each other very well. And I know Frank and uh, Adam, you guys know each other uh, in person. I haven't had the pleasure too much. I think we shook hands in New Jersey uh, a short time, uh, but that's, that's really been the, the person to person interaction. So it's nice to actually kind of, you know, sit down and, and, and talk and we've we've been doing so for a half hour or so and it's and it's it's gone beautifully so this will immediately go off the rails because we're we're down yeah, uh exactly. now but um but yeah so thank you thank you for for coming on we appreciate it no one escapes the origin story so mm -hmm. we know who you are but who the hell are you and how did you get here yeah i guess uh you know, we'll keep it flesh and blood oriented because mm -hmm. there's a, a whole saga behind the rest of my life. But I, I think how I, I plant got that seed now, now I've got the itch. But yeah, I yeah, think... exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm a, I'm a showman at heart, you know. Uh, but for for flesh and blood, I, I think it was a day in uh, March of 2021. And I had been seeing the Flesh and Blood ads on and off for a couple of months, clearly kicking myself for not getting in earlier in, you know, like December 2020 or something like that. But we had just moved cities, or I guess it would have been April. We had just moved cities, you know, didn't play uh, much card games anymore uh, compared to, you know, playing Magic a few years ago and before COVID as well. 
and I was kind of just, you know, had that itch of wanting to play some games. And I figured, you know, in a new city, a good way to meet people, make friends and stuff like that is to get into a new game. And so we walk into a game store, uh, one that I don't actually frequent very much anymore. Uh, but I was just, you know, like I just said, hey, like what's what's available? And uh, they I don't think they had uh, anything at a very good price, which maybe also isn't why I don't go there very often. But they said the Monarch pre, uh, pre-constructed decks were coming in uh, in the next week or something like that, and that I should come back and pick up some of those. And so we ended up doing that, uh, played with the Monarch pre-constructed decks for a bit, and uh, the Arcane. we bought a box of Arcane Rising, I think, uh, and tried to make some sealed decks out of that. All of them were terrible. And this was just me and my partner over our kitchen table, you know, just trying out the game. And she thought it was like, okay, uh, like, you know, the game mechanics were fun and worth playing. But I was like pretty hooked. And so I took that bad uh, Arcane Rising seal deck. And the first thing I did was, all right, I got to go on to the website and see if there's a way to like discuss this game online with people. And so I go to Discord. I find the Flesh and Blood community Discord. And that's kind of like really the start of it all, where I got hooked both on the, uh, you know, expansion of uh, gameplay options beyond, you know, kind of your basic understanding of the rules when you play for the first time. And then also like the community aspect of it, um, both online and in person later on, uh, just like how much, you know, how, how vibrant basically the community is in all of these ways and how awesome it is to be able to connect with people through kind of the medium of a card game yeah, and then, yeah and i guess that is there's a, a middle part but you know we can <laughs> get back to some of that later um so you mentioned you mentioned finding you know the community discord and i think that's where like a lot of people know you as the lazy dog amongst other things but you uh you you are one of the more like prominent discord figures in in flesh and blood uh, I, that didn't happen overnight you now how how did you kind of cultivate your uh, your 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 reputation and uh, you know your 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 popularity on discord yeah it's interesting because i think at the very beginning when i started using discord i was very much a questions person because i didn't have a great understanding of the game but also, as you know how it is in, you know, community forums or Discord and stuff like that in general, like a lot of the information that gets uh, shared and repeated is, you know, not always the most readily accessible to new players. And what my approach is for uh, both learning something in Discord, like let's just talk about simple gameplay for now. Uh, if I learn something about gameplay for a hero, I'm I'm going to be quite willing to regurgitate that back out to somebody else that's asking similar questions or bring that up in a different but related discussion about the same hero or the same matchup. And so I think like for probably the first couple of months, that was like the bulk of my, uh, you know, the type of interaction that I had on Discord. And I think that's like a really valuable part of why people come to the Flesh and Blood community Discord. I think that the strategic value that players that either don't have the experience because they've just joined the game or even if they've played and playing for a while just like aren't that familiar with a hero or class uh like just being able to get the strategic knowledge and those level ups without having to put in an excessive amount of time like that's a really valuable thing for growing the game and growing interest uh in flesh and blood and so Beyond that, I think that I just did that cycle enough times where I participated in pretty much every channel of heroes that I was interested in playing. So at the beginning, that was maybe like four or five heroes. But you know how it is with card games. You like the desire to collect and own every card balloons out Mm -hmm. of control. And suddenly I'm like, okay, well, I'm only missing two more rainbow foil legendaries from welcome to wraith why don't i just get them and then i can also play warrior and then i can also play guardian you know and i guess maybe you know it might have been scab skins was the last one i got but you know something along those lines and because i did that i uh you know i was more incentivized or motivated to uh post in the other channels for all of the other heroes because i was like oh i've got these cards and i want to use them you know i want to be able to 
understand the decks and both be able to play them and uh, play against them. So from there, I think it was just a matter of, you know, good old fashioned banter with the kind of some same community staples that we've seen uh, in the different channels. And I would definitely say that people are way more inclined to stick to, you know, the hero channels that they play. At least that's my grand observation of the Discord approach of most players. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to talk shit with, with, with everybody about the game in every channel. And so it, it kind of uh, got wildly out of control from there. Uh, that does uh, bring me to our first community question. Uh, you do change names on that Discord more than people change underwear. And uh, Discord member Kromsler asks, roughly how many times do you think you have changed your Discord handle on the international Discord? It's got to be more than 20 times at this point. Like, I I think that both, like, just thinking about the amount of time that I've been changing my name and also just... You know, I'm likely to change my Discord handle if there's a precipitating incident, let's say, of, you know, maybe a metagame change or a big event or something funny that happens that's a fun meme or even just like fun incidents that occur on Discord that, you know, are fun to poke fun at, basically. Like, then I'll change my username. So it's definitely over 20 times. Like, maybe we're not quite at 30. Like, that seems a bit high to me, but 20, 25 for sure. And, and you know what? Actually, maybe let me just give the story of i don't remember if it was the first time i changed my name on the international discord or the second but it starts from a hero that's very uh near and dear to my heart and by that i mean i've never registered it to play at a, a sanctioned event of any sort but i've played quite a bit of it um i was in the levi channel and mm, a, you know that is a place that it, is a place it's got some Great characters. It's got some, you know, passionate players. I think that yes, play passion brute. is definitely what I would would prescribe to that group. Yeah, and to play brute and especially Levia, who's been the most maligned brute of the two, I guess in CC. Um, I, I I think you just have to have a certain kind of like you know intensity about you, and that makes for fun discussion, right? Like I don't, I personally don't take it seriously when people. You don't have strong opinions and disagree and i hope that nobody <laughs> takes what i say too seriously because that would be a hazard to their health probably um but i was in there talking about uh ebon fold because mm -hmm. ebon fold at the time was played in uh some chain decks i think this was during road to national season or thereabouts uh in 2021 and it was played in some chain decks uh for the ability to draw the extra card and it was obviously very popular in Blitz, where you get it for the Spell Void, as well as the ability to basically draw an extra card. And I was talking about how, you know, in the idea of uh, playing off of a four or five card hand, getting that one extra card can, you know, potentially uh, push your damage ceiling of what you push over your opponent's blocks, like, by quite a bit. And so to me, Ebonfold's just like a very powerful piece of equipment. It's just always just draw one card for the Shadow Heroes uh, that's on your headpiece, and it's accessible for one uh, resource. So that's like the framework of the discussion. At the time, there was another uh, headpiece that had just been popularized by Mansant because he had played it to some of the Road to Nationals, I believe, if I'm remembering the timeline correctly. And it was Hope Merchant's Hood. And I actually love Hope Merchant's Hood as a headpiece. I think I came to love it a lot more uh, once I played it in Viscerai as well. But like the idea of a free mulligan, also like quite relevant for certain decks and archetypes. But the logic for why, uh, you know, for why you would play Hope Merchant's Hood was presented as, well, in Levi, you're guaranteed going to brick at some point in the game, and you don't want to die because of that. And so... You know, I'm going to play Hope Merchant's Hood so that if I draw a hand that doesn't banish any cards while I have six blood debt cards in uh, my banish zone, I'm not just going to instantly die. And the idea is that it can bail you out of these awkward situations. And in a better way than uh, Ebon Fold, because even though Ebon Fold banishes a card from hand, uh, spending a resource to do that often makes your turn awkward enough that you're not actually getting extra value out of that drawing extra card. So it's almost like a less flexible 
uh, bailout button compared to the Hope Merchant's Hood. And that, I think, is actually fine. Like that framework and approach of viewing Hope Merchant's Hood as like your insurance policy. You know, it's the same thing with uh, gambler's gloves in the game right now. It's your insurance policy for if something goes terribly wrong. And I just don't like to play the game that way. I think a combination of it is that having done a little bit of the math of, you know, what the likely outcomes are for decks that play into that kind of strategy. But then also part of it is just like my preference. I just don't want to play a deck that, you know, uh, needs to rely on an insurance button, right? I would rather play the deck that has a, you know, 30% rate of actually just instantly losing the game against any opponent of any skill level. You know, you'll lose to a day one player playing a pre-constructed deck. 30% auto loss. Like, let's say you've played a equivalent of, you know, Pact of Negation or something like that uh, in Magic. I'd rather play a deck that has that at a 30% rate, but then wins every other game 70% of the time in an exciting fashion, hopefully. You know, otherwise, why would I be playing the deck? Rather than playing a deck that says, oh, well, if I play Hope Merchant's Hood, I can creep my win rate close to 50-50 in every matchup. And that just sounds, you know, uh, I say I've done the math, so like maybe not 100% of the math. Uh, those numbers are definitely made up. But I'd much rather play the deck that just is always doing the more powerful thing and has large consequences for failure, but can consistently perform uh, and works towards that game plan and accept the risk of losing rather than the deck that is afraid to do that and is afraid of, you know, taking a bad role somewhere. You know, it's all about the actual uh, expected value that I want to calculate when I play. I don't want to have an expected value that's lower and choose that because the psychological ramifications of losing are somehow worse, basically. So yeah, and so anyways, I was having a war with uh, Leviah Channel and so somebody was saying, you know, uh, how much they loved Hope Merchant's Hood. They came into the conversation and they were saying they loved Hope Merchant's Hood as a clear dig towards me. And I, I, I you know, obviously as a, a well-adjusted member of society, couldn't let that stand. So I changed my username to Cope Merchant's Hood. And that was kind of like the start of all the pun usernames. I think I had you know, Bramble Snark in that uh, vicinity. I think Command and Bonker was also one of the early ones. <laughs> and all those are, you know, it's th not meant to be too serious. It's just lighthearted fun. Yeah, actually, I, I, I absolutely recall seeing both of those uh, in, or much earlier, like early in, in my in my time on the Discord, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, let me ask you, do you remember seeing the Lazy Dog in the Discord server before that? Uh, because... Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, like you had mentioned, like you you uh, you started posting on like a few of the channels, and like that escalated to like all the character like hero channels. Uh, it seems you know, and, and now and now you're you know you are you're, you're everywhere. Uh, I don't <laughs> I don't know how you do it <laughs> personally, uh, but you do talk about. Um, like, Leviah in general, right, is is one of those interesting heroes where I really think it's. Uh, I almost quit Flesh and Blood because I started on, on her, uh, and the and that's, that blows my mind that people would recommend her as the first hero. Well, Sorry, that's the on. thing. So, well, right. So I I didn't know any better, right? Much like you, I started I started in Monarch. I picked up the precons, but I fell in love with the idea of. Right, a big heavy. I come from magic, and I come from like you know, kind of like uh, green. You know, big stuff. Have fun, right? So, uh, it was it was either the angels or the or the demons, and I you know uh, go to the demon side. So like uh, that really spoke to me. Shadow brute seemed really cool. Have the banishing as a cost felt somewhat familiar, and then. I just lost <laughs> you know, myself like repeatedly. Um, and no matter what I did for three months, I was on, I was on her. And uh, just before road to national seasons, uh, I, I pivoted to Katsu. But uh, in that time I was like, what is happening? Like, I cannot, I, I can't put it together. Uh, it's just terrible. Psychologically for a new player, it is, it feels like it's just would be devastating unless you like, you, to your point about like uh, your, your win loss ratio and what these will do for you, you really have to 
get the experience in the game before I feel like you can work with a deck with that kind of guaranteed loss uh, in built into uh in, into your play because starting out man i tell you what that is it is such a tough pill to swallow and you really can't like comprehend that that aspect of it uh until you've like really put the reps in with the rest of the game uh and uh i just guys don't pick up love you first just yeah. don't do <laughs> yeah so, something you mentioned there with uh um having you know like or be, just knowing that there's games that are you're guaranteed to lose basically like mm-hmm. i played lexi to the uh the second pro tour and that is a deck that even though it's so powerful like you know i would say it is more powerful actually of a ceiling than Levia. But similarly, has those guaranteed loss games, and like I think that of my, uh, what was it, eight rounds of CC, you know, I I I would personally put her guaranteed loss rate at somewhere between one and eight and one to six. And I think I played three games or four games that were like completely unwinnable, and that's fine because that's what you're signing up for when you play these heroes, right? That's what I said. Mm-hmm. I would rather play the hero that I can auto win my 70% and then just have a 30% loss if that's actually the highest win rate in the format. And, you know, I felt like Lexi was pretty well positioned. But, like, if you tell a new player that they have to play Lexi and they, or Levi and they have to bash their head repeatedly against the wall, and not only are they getting these guaranteed losses, they're not always able to get the guaranteed wins because of their inexperience as a player or because, you know, they don't know what is the purpose of uh, the deck, basically, right? And so, yeah, yeah exactly. I don't know. <laughs> not not a great time. No, I, I can, I feel for those in the channel because there is, a, there, especially in the international Discord, there is, like, there's a ton of new players, but you get to this, this especially morose ones in the in the yeah. in the channels of the heroes that will die uh and trying to trying to break that that cycle of abuse that comes with uh playing her is 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 a tough one to crack there um moving on you uh you very recently casted the Canadian Nationals Practically solo, Rob. I'm gonna get his name wrong. What's his last name? Uh, Macaulay. Macaulay from Spark of Genius. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you casted the Canadian Nationals uh, with Rob Macaulay from Spark of Genius helping out. What seems like for uh, two straight days, you lived in a diner's uh, a booth with a, a camera and just you, just just doing it. Uh, and everyone, everyone loved it. You did a fantastic job doing it. You, you didn't crack once, uh, and, and seems like 84 hours of, of casting. Uh, I want to know how that came to be and, uh, and a little bit about your experience as, uh, the caster of a premier event like Canadian nationals. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I've, I, I, I definitely think that, uh, Part of the way it lined up for me to be the person to do it was just, you know, uh, the way the tournament organizer had set up uh, Card of Magica. They did a great job with the event, but, you know, they didn't have the budget to bring in uh, someone really, really big. I know they had contacted Flake at one point. Great guy. But, uh, you know, like comparing my personal experience to uh, professional kind of thing, you know, uh, cost wise, I think for them was a big factor. And they reached out to me much later on in the process. Uh, and then me and Rob are both locals. Uh, we live around in Ottawa. So getting that lined up was uh, where, where the nationals were hosted and getting that lined up was uh, really good. But yeah, honestly, uh, the, the actual like time that passed was a bit of a blur because it, it just felt like, you know, stuff kept happening and I was, you know, it was going from one thing to the next. I didn't really have time to think about how much time had passed or how tired I was or what, you know, needed to, to happen basically here and there. Uh, so it was all just part, I don't want to say off the cuff because we did plan some stuff. We had a, you know, Google Doc with some notes uh, we put together beforehand and we talked about how we wanted to approach it, whether we wanted to do a 
a uh, person on play-by-play -play kind of thing and a person as the color commentary. Uh, but in the end, it just was like quite organic. Just, you know, I think that I, uh, as a person that uh, maybe thinks about the game in a more competitive lens, I was more the play-by-play -play guy in the booth. And then Rob was kind of adding the flavor commentary uh, as we went along. And, you know, I, was, I just I just had a lot of fun. I just love talking about the game and talking about uh, the different ways that, you know, heroes and decks and cards can all interact and i think that you know when when they put me in front of a mic it was like oh yeah like just forget that the mic is there and just say what you would want to say for sure um it does bring us to our next community question from the aforementioned flake matt demarco he asks is casting a 13 hour day harder than you thought and do you have a new appreciation for broadcasting i i think it's like definitely harder than most people think i think think I was like sufficiently prepared because I'd heard from people that you know it's like it is a lot of work both in preparation ahead of time on the part of the tournament organizers and then the other people uh, like oh and also Ali our person that ran uh, uh, all the tech basically um, and you know getting all of that set up was time that extended beyond the time that we were live right like when I was on I was like on camera and I was, you know, speaking basically. But then when the camera was off or between rounds a little bit, I could like be off a little bit more. Whereas for all the people working all around that, you know, they're like on almost the whole day. And I feel like that's definitely really, really hard. And so definitely I think like my appreciation is for people that can both do the the show and then also like run the show for, you know, maybe the time that you're doing the commentary and then also the time that you're uh setting up and then taking down all of the stuff afterwards that's like the the, the real uh marathon of, of the event i think was for those guys and how immersed did you find yourself in the actual kind of like player experience as the days went on were you able to pick up uh kind of um what am i asking here uh play patterns of certain players were you able to see start to see uh tendencies and uh, things of that nature that kind of made uh analyzing the matches like more interesting to see that individual like progress through the day um and uh or just like certain things that you were able to like pick up as you went yeah and you know what uh maybe i should have mentioned this earlier when uh you asked first about what it was like to you know commentate but i guess in in the groups that i test in or like play games in uh, I'm probably the biggest backseater of most of them. You know, I, for me, it's a conscious decision I make when we sit down in a voice chat and I watch and spectate a game. I make a conscious choice and effort not to say anything a lot of the time because otherwise it will just come out. And I think that I'm still quite selective about it or was at least for this uh, event that I casted uh, about what I would say out loud but all of my game analysis happens in the form of questions, I think. Um, even in my head, it's always, how much damage does this hand do? What is the purpose of uh, these cards? What is the purpose of this line that I'm envisioning, perhaps? And so then when a player plays it out, I'm asking those same questions. And I'm saying, OK, what, you know, uh, why, why would uh, Yuki choose to take this damage here to resolve a frost hex? What is the game state? What is the goal of this maneuver kind of thing? And so I think that by asking the questions, even if I don't know the answer, I'm posing them in a way to uh, the audience so that, you know, we can kind of interrogate that further together and find out as the player uh, goes through those motions. There's some that are a lot more intuitive, especially in uh, Uprising Draft, I think. Uh, it's easier to understand the cards and the game state because uh, there's not these... Uh, or there's maybe not, I shouldn't say there aren't, but there's slightly fewer, uh, you know, long game arcs where uh, certain choices much earlier on in the game won't have or will have an, a much later impact. Everything's like an immediate impact. It's like, OK, if I block with this card, I'm gaining two life guaranteed. And then if I keep the card, I'm losing two life, but I'm dealing three damage. Like you're just immediately making that trade, that conversion of, you know, one life basically right there. and in the context i think of game analysis it's like 
you know, if I can put myself in the player's seat and say, would I make this, this, this decision? It's really easy for me to then say, I think this is what they're trying to do. You know, I th maybe if they chose to block, I would say, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to save that one life because having that life total later so that they keep four cards instead of just three cards is going to help them win the game. If I can put them in that player's seat and say, okay, they're taking the damage, what I can come to the conclusion of is they're trying to make a big push right now and prevent the opponent from being able to keep cards again in the game. So yeah, I guess it's like, you know, almost like Socratic method or something along those lines. I'm just constantly viewing things through the lens of question is what is the, uh, you know, what is the outcome that I want? What is the outcome that I can imagine for uh, for the player? That is that is very well put. Uh, what are your um, so now that you've done it once, uh, what are your thoughts on doing it again? I would love to do more commentary, and it's interesting because I I think that you know what I what I do in commentary uh, that's similar to what a lot of the more dedicated content creators and you know let's say professionals for you know folks that are doing uh commentary for these tier four events and stuff like that like what i do that's similar to them is i think that i try to uh you know take it seriously enough to form a narrative around it i think that i try to be the uh I guess, I guess almost character or something like that. I'm trying to be the character that people uh, want from the uh, commentator. And a lot of that is my own character. A lot of that is uh, my personality coming through. You know, when I make snarky comments about uh, card puns and stuff like that, that's just me. Uh, but like, I think that, you know, uh, approaching it with like this semi-serious mindset of you're putting on a show for people is you know a really good way to do uh uh to, to make content basically right like that's exactly what you're trying to do and you know i think that i'm i i love doing that in like the abstract art way of where i think making content or making art as and presenting ideas and uh you know whether it's my personality or like a made-up version of my personality as an act like i think that's a lot of fun but I think that is always what's going to separate me from somebody that makes content on a regular schedule or somebody that uh, does commentary for these events because they have to take it seriously all the time to, well, maybe not all the time, but you know, like they have to take it more seriously all of the time than I would. And they have to approach it in a way that's both, you know, uh, made for audience consumption and then also. Uh, still meeting all of, I guess, the general criteria of the event and uh, jumping through all the hoops of what the expectations are. I think when I go into uh, that kind of situation, I'm doing it for the show, but also it's like, it's just a form of expression. It's just like, I just want to go in there and say what I would say, you know? I just want to uh, play up the character of the commentator, but I also want to just do it for fun. And that's kind of how I feel about flesh and blood and maybe games in general. It's like I could optimize my gameplay and I can optimize my play testing and I can optimize my, you know, life schedule around getting the best possible results at events and stuff like that. But then it wouldn't be, you know, what I like to do. And then it would probably lose the luster of what makes the game enjoyable for me. You know, you speak, I, I think I meandered a bit there. In, in no, 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 you're good. Um, you speak of content as art, and that brings me to my next community question. Asked by Carolina Alvarado, known as Little Uzi Squirt. She asks, how many deviled eggs can you eat in one sitting? And can you demonstrate? Or if you have, where can we find that? Yeah, so um, I have a YouTube page. Uh, it's I was I think I made it when I was in 10th grade and me and one of my friends 
uh, made one video that we uploaded and then it's been deleted from the channel. I can't find it anymore. And uh, it's just been attached to my Gmail account. So I've just been using this YouTube channel for managing my subscriptions. And then, you know, kind of earlier this year, I wanted to dive into the art form of, let's call it 2000s era cringe comedy. I think that's maybe like the best description for it. Uh, Pretty accurate, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, you know, like, why am I eating as many deviled eggs as I can? Well, I guess that one was kind of like for a bet almost. Not quite a bet, but, you know, uh, as a challenge. Like, it's not actually that I think people want to see this content. I don't, I don't think there's like an algorithm that's optimizing for saying, oh, this is like scientifically proven to be the most engaging uh, content that exists in there. I just thought it'd be funny. I thought it'd be entertaining for me. And it was. I know how many double eggs I can eat now in one sitting. And the answer is uh, 16. Uh, that is 16 whole eggs deviled. Well, I guess it's 15 whole eggs deviled plus one egg worth of mayonnaise. And then I think, though, uh, if I wanted to, I could have eaten three more without puking. But I would have felt terrible, and that's why I didn't eat them. Like, the video is, like, a little bit weird, but it's not that uh, gross because I didn't make myself feel bad. And, I, I like, I thought that would be both bad art and bad feeling. So, you know, both of those things. But there's other videos out there, too, uh, on the channel. Uh, the Lazy Dog. And... Uh, yeah, there's like just some that are me reviewing foods, which I think like not all of them are meant to be as comedic as, as others. Like some of them definitely lean into cringe and lean into comedy. And some of them are just like, I don't know, I just thought it would be nice to eat this food. And so like if I can share something that brought me a little bit of joy, uh, the experience of eating new food to somebody else and show them what that looks like, you know, maybe it'll just be entertaining for them for a brief moment, a respite in uh whatever the world they're living in right now i can definitely appreciate that adam you you uh <clears throat> you you physically cringe there a little bit how what are your thoughts on on, on deviled eggs any like deviled eggs egg salad anything with like a hard-boiled egg that's been somehow processed just ugh. really i'm also not so a fan had... of pickles <laughs> oh We're interesting did you did you see the pickled cheesecake tweet? Because that was great. Oh, I did. That was terrible. <laughs> I would eat it just to see how it tasted. I have no limits when it comes to food. Like, put it in front of me. I will eat it. I will try everything one time. Because, like, what is the worst that it could be, right? I've eaten pretty bad food before. Well, and let's say foods, you know, not anything that will get me sick or anything. You know, I, um, I, I, I I loved all that. I saw that uh, happening, and I showed my wife. And I'm a big guy. I'm a big yeah. guy. I love double eggs. So I was like, "What do you oh, think? Pat, are this? you going to do the challenge? I might. I might do it. I might. Do do, it. I might do it by by accident. Uh, like Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I I take I take the tray <laughs> and I walk away. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's very, very likely to happen, uh, and uh, specifically because this video now exists. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I may, I may have the uh, the challenge to your challenge uh, coming up soon. You just, I, what I can't do is just, uh, just make thirty deviled eggs on a whim. I need a reason, or like at least a, you know, uh, a little uh, scapegoat for that. Then Thanksgiving's perfect time yeah. to get uh, in excess of eggs and, and for someone to devil them for me. I cannot devil uh, the eggs myself, but um, can't or won't. I, <laughs> I, you know what? Given enough time, I can learn just about anything. So, you know, it's probably just more efficiently done with the people that uh, that do know how professional devilers. how to do that. Yeah, and egg, my egg fa- devilers, as we call yeah, them. the egg devilers. <laughs> we we just had Canadian Thanksgiving up here. It's like American Thanksgiving, but we have it earlier, so I think it's mm-hmm. just better. We're thankful by sooner. Default. Yeah, we're more thankful. Um, and <laughs> and and so we had deviled eggs at that meal, and uh. My partner asked me how many I was going to eat, and I said probably just like the normal, yeah, uh, <laughs> just the regular amount now. So you, so you weren't you weren't like you weren't like turned off from deviled eggs for for a bit after that. No, I I think like 
I think I actually ate eggs like the next day. Like I just, we just had like scrambled eggs or something. I was like, yeah, this is great. Like you know. excellent, excellent. That's what I was afraid of if I got sick. Is if I ate so many, I got sick. I was afraid that I wouldn't want to eat eggs for a while. Because that's that happens f- for foods, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it does. I it just it is, I knew we were gonna get into some food, but I didn't know this is already this is great. Um, I just had bad sushi last night, and I'm Ooh. I'm like furious Ooh. about it. Uh, yeah. Like I, I was, it wasn't, I didn't get sick or anything, but it was just like subpar and yeah. it was from a restaurant that I thought I could, I could trust. Oh, it's and, like a trail, right? Yeah, it was, it was, it really, it, it hurt the heart uh, there. Cause I was really, I was really looking all, I'm a tuna maki guy and that's all I wanted. Just yeah. two rolls and I got them and they were just not great. Mm-hmm. Not wonder, great. You're from uh, the Eastern seaboard, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I gotta say, I, uh, grew up in on the west coast and i just have never found great sushi specifically anywhere out east it's like a a true failing of i don't know supply chains or something (laughs) it it is you know and there is uh my 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 failure was that the restaurant that i do truly trust with my sushi was closed that day so i went with the plan b and Mm -hmm. They they did not give them a plan B. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not as good as plan A, I think. That's usually what they say. (laughs) (laughs) It would have been plan A if it was a good plan. Um Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was that was the food segment there. We did it. We can we can revisit food anytime, by the way. Anytime. Absolutely. We can do that. Um what I do want to talk to you about is a bit of your, uh, your, your competitive past so far in Flesh and Blood, and and potentially a competitive future. What what is, uh, uh, you 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 have qualified for Pro Tour, Leal. Um, I don't have your entire jacket in front of me, but you are a very good Flesh and Blood player. Give me give me some of the stats here. Yeah, so uh, I played at. Canadian Nationals last year and I was new enough to the game that uh, I wasn't that good of a player but you play enough and you get in and I think that in between road to Nats in uh, last year and the first pro quest season you know that was kind of like when I started taking the most interest in uh kind of the deeper intricacies of gameplay. And I think that's just something that you play enough flesh and blood, everyone gets to that point where they just want to play the game more. And that's, you know, whether you're a casual or competitive player, it's like, you know, you just want to play. And so uh, when the first ProQuest season was going on, I think we were just out of interest rather than any specific goal. Like there wasn't actually that much uh, structure around a lot of it. I think we were playing like, you know, three or four games every single day from probably two weeks before Everfest all the way until the first ban and restricted announcement, which was after the ProQuest season. Like we were just playing games like almost every single day, multiple hours. And it was just like, oh, like we just wanted to play games of flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe you give me a bit too much credit for saying I'm a good player, but I guess like I'm I you know, without without being conceited, I think like I'm a decent player uh that can keep up with some other decent players. <laughs> and and you know, it's actually interesting. I had this conversation a few days ago about how I rate myself as a player and how I rate myself in relation to other players that are good players. And uh, this person who uh, will not be named, nice person, but, you know, strong opinions. Uh, They said that, yeah, like you're like way underselling yourself. And basically it means that you're, uh, you know, failing in life if you don't actually view yourself honestly. You're just not giving yourself credit in any situation. If you look at somebody who's a very good player... Uh, let's say you just look at number one on the uh, ELO leaderboard and you say, oh, like, uh, I'm a worse player than that person. 
and that's like your thought process going in you're not going to succeed this is what this person was saying to me and and they uh they followed up with when i look at that person number one on the leaderboard i think uh you know i'm better than them like already <laughs> you know and 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 you know what with with the person that was saying this is i, I kind of believe like they fully think this because that's their approach to uh learning and improving and you know having that belief in themselves and for me i think there's like you know a uh subjective or maybe not subjective uh there's like a social component to it i don't want to be conceited because i think it robs people the wrong way but i'm also willing to to admit to myself or i have a good idea for myself of where my actual skill level is and where my actual potential is if i were to you know continue to put in two to three hours in the game every single day for an extended period of time because that's like training right that goes beyond practice that goes well maybe it's still practice it is practice but it goes beyond just playing the game if you're training for a premiere event if you're trying to play and practice to perform and you really you know break it down into its core components of what is important and what leads to success i think i could do a pretty good job if i made myself go through that regimen i just don't know that that's you know how i want to approach the game Absolutely. You know, they say uh, to steal other sport adages there that it's not practice that makes perfect, right? It's perfect practice that makes perfect. So being able to train with intent and uh, being able to make the corrections, you know, on the fly as you go, or at the very least, be able to break down your your results afterwards and, you know, in an intelligent manner and translate that into uh you know into success in in other you know other future games so we talked to recently to uh michael hamilton right who's whose ability to uh understand his own pitch stack and his opponent's pitch stack comes from such intent with practice uh knowing the timing of his right he he's playing into the second and third cycles regularly with much slower decks so he, he's he's comfortable with that grind and can can account for like every card in either player's deck that has been shown as information uh, mm-hmm. there, and that that only comes with that kind of uh, right practice with intent uh, there. It, the difference between jamming games right and then trying to become better. It's, yeah, it's, for sure. there, there's a clear line there. Um, as you've as you've developed into uh, uh, quite the competitive player, um, your reputation for your heuristics, uh, heuristics, uh, mm. is is <laughs> uh, is what I think is, it's one of your uh, I think trademarks in the uh, in the competitive banter community is that your understanding of the in-game economics uh, and value of individual cards and uh, the overall the, it's already big brain for me this is the part of the game <laughs> i don't understand uh, as 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 much as i would like but uh, give me give me kind of an understanding of how you kind of you view y- your view of the game and mechanically in that kind of uh that kind of philosophy of the 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 card value matrix uh Mm -hmm. as it as it comes yeah so maybe we'll give you the i'll give you the history lesson on my personal journey of how i came to this so i mentioned last year in road to nat season i played and i did okay and at the time i was playing chain i think it's easy to succeed with a deck like chain because you don't need to understand every heuristic you don't need to do the math on everything because it's just so obvious what the extra value is. Extra cards, extra action points, that's just like plus, right? It's like very on the surface. Um, I think that I played quite a number of games with Grendel on uh, the International Discord and a number of games with uh, Matt folks at one point. Um, and both of those guys, as well as quite a number of other really good players, uh, they really, uh, you know, they really convinced me. I don't know how, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they really convinced me that the best way to really both 
accurately assess, but then also uh, simplify for the game situation when you're playing the game. Like the best way to accurately assess is to break everything down into numbers, because at the end of the day, uh, you win the game with better numbers than your opponent. Depending on certain factors like evasion or uh, you know like effects like dominate or arcane damage, or things like uh, you know like intimidate from brute, like sometimes that throws a wrench in the whole total better numbers plan. But for the most part, if you have better numbers than your opponent all of the time, you will usually win the game because that's just how it works. Like if I'm attacking you for ten every turn and you're attacking me for nine. Uh, I'm just going to kill you first. Uh, simplified, basically. But, you know. Um, and when I started to think about all of my turns in this way, I found that there was like a huge improvement to results. Because before, you could play a turn with Chain and just do all of the stuff. And if you're good mechanically, you can intuit a lot of these uh, these lines. Uh, later on, I was playing a lot of Viscerai, and especially with Skeleta, it's like if you could just intuit a lot of the good lines, because both you see them enough times if you play the game a lot, or you, uh, you know, there's just like one line, basically. You just execute the best thing, which is like a skill that you have to develop. But when you start playing decks that are, uh, I guess, decks that don't always present or like tell you the number that you're getting out of a certain action, on the face of the card, it gets a lot harder to assess. And that's actually where it's more important to ascribe a number to these. Because if I attack you with a snatch for four, and you're going to take four damage from it if you don't block it, but you're also going to give me a card, like, is the snatch worth four damage, or is it worth four damage plus the card that I'm drawing off of it? That's kind of like the simplest example I can think of. It's just, you know, snatch. And if you're ever in a game situation where you're attacking with scar for a scars and i don't know like uh brutal assaults and stuff like that and your opponent's attacking with snatch and cnc and stuff like that like the total number clearly or sorry the, the number of the on hit clearly has to be factored in somewhere and so i think that uh you know part of it is getting good at intuiting what the number is but also part of it is when you're in testing and when you're playing it you should calculate out the number for every single line i was talking to a quite good player like a player that is very good intuitively at the game very uh good at fundamentals very good at all the mechanics of flesh and blood and i said to him uh yeah when i draw up my hand with it was with five uh, great deck uh, meets a lot of my criteria for what I enjoy in decks. And I was saying, yeah, when I draw my hand with five, the first thing I do is I just calculate how much damage I can do with this hand. Like, assume there's no blocks. Assume I get to play every single card. And he was like, wow, you do that for every single hand that you draw? And I was like, how are you so good of a player and you don't do that, you know? It's like, how are you able to just, like, work through that? And I think part of it is also the uh, decks that you play. Some decks are so much less uh, important for doing that math. But especially for a deck like Phi, it's like losing two block out of my hand or like using a card to block for two, that can be like a 10 damage swing, right? I can lose 10 value by blocking with two. And that's like, that's, that's, that's crazy. But then if I don't do the math on every turn, how am I going to know when it's worth it? How am I going to know when my opponent's turn is actually, you know, going to necessitate me to give up 10 value by blocking with one card? What if they're on hit is worth 10 value? Um, that's a little bit extreme, but uh, you know, what, what if it's actually worth it for me to block? What if it's actually worth it for me to block with uh, eight block out of my hand and just pass back to them? Which is like a terrible line a lot of the time for ninja. But like that's the worst part about blocking. I hate blocking. Blocking's terrible. Blocking's bad. But also, <laughs> if you're a good flesh and blood player, you have to know how to block and you have to know when to block. And knowing when to block at the perfect time, even when it looks ridiculous, is like the, you know, like a, a pri like important skill, right? And I just think that, you know, the best way to know exactly that spot is to be able to do the math up front first and say, okay, here's, uh, here's the perceived benefit of blocking or not blocking. And then, and then you get it into the level two, which is not even 
just the numbers, but it's we were on level one. That was level one. Was oh how man, much, how I much can't play the numbers. This game. How big the numbers? I, I suck. I suck at this. Level two is I am, I am literally writing notes on what you're saying so that I, that yeah, I can we'll, remember. We'll play that. games together. We'll do we'll do this as an exercise. I, I I say I do it every single turn. I what I really do is I just do the damage calculation. I don't do the full mm -hmm. uh, value calculation for every turn. I just do the total number the, simplified. I, I'm I am listening intently because yeah. I am I am also on Fi, but I feel like I'm missing something. And I I also I don't suck, right? I know I don't suck, mm -hmm. but y you talk about like the perfect block at the perfect time. Yeah. And I know I'm missing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I did like a dash. I am over uh against dash on pounder for I don't know. Like, it feels like I shouldn't be, but I am. Mm -hmm. And it like, and I know that there is that moment where, uh, like that life swing is had, like, I should have bought, bought, you know, six life off of one block where, Oh, <laughs> but I really, I really want to figure it out <laughs> there, mm -hmm. but I am, I am a hundred percent not there, but that's like, I've, I've gotten to the point where I know Fi like, I can make a good five card hand. It, like th this is my like with five. I can do good five, good uh, five card hands, good three card hands, good one card hands. If I have four, uh, you know, four, four or two, I'm considering. I'm considering my life choices at that at that point. But if if I start with like a five card hand, then I am uh, like I'm, I'm thinking real hard about how much damage it takes to the face, and it's that's always the point where it's like. Uh, you know, they presented 18.5 damage on this turn, and you only produced 17.6. So you really should have dropped that two block uh, onto the third part of the, you know, third link in the combat mm -hmm. chain and taken the two instead of the three. And now you're gonna die because of it. And the 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 specter of that, you know, in you know, slightly inefficient two block on you know the middle of the game that you didn't you you forgot about by the time it gets to the end game it that haunts me just yeah. the telltale block just constantly just beating down my door mentally and Slowly. and i think they're there i had a... to get that off my chest sorry <laughs> i just i just decompressed for a moment there no that's great i, I yeah no th th that's definitely like the biggest thing i think especially about the aggro matchup is like one concept that i just strongly believe in is manufacturing a game state and it's kind of like a mean nothing phrase a lot of the time uh probably especially when i say it because i say it so often but what i mean by manufacturing a game state is from the very moment that you start the game you want to already be thinking about how you are going to finish the game and win and what you described there was your you were not able to save enough life at the end of the game to keep enough cards to pressure your opponent's hand and then kill them. So what I'm saying is basically, so that's kind of like the lead in. This is maybe even level three compared to what I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Like the level one is the numbers. The level two is now we add probabilities to that. How likely are we to see certain outcomes? How likely is my opponent to see certain outcomes uh, continually in the future you know like what other hands are they likely to draw basically like instead of just doing this across one turn i'm doing it across the subsequent turns based on the information i've seen before and then also like uh you know like if i block with every single card here instead of, like like you mentioned you know maybe blocking for two plus a piece of armor or maybe blocking for four with two cards or five with two cards like maybe that is saving me uh you know like seven or eight life instead of just five but knowing that i'm saving seven or eight life instead of five like maybe i should actually just block with all of, all of my cards you know that's that's kind of my thought there which is where we get into level three which is that um you've got to plan a way to put your opponent into checkmate you can't just say i'm just going to keep putting them in check and hope that nothing bad happens to me You've got to actually plan out the checkmate play for your opponent from turn one of the game. When I attack with an aggro deck, what I'm trying to do, especially against another aggro deck, as I said, I'm trying to 
threaten cards from their hand that are actually must like i want them to be obliged to block with the last card in their hand not just the first one i wanted them to be obliged with to block with the last card of their hand before i am if you can do that you'll win if you if i just make them block with the first two cards of their hand but i'm at four health and they can threaten seven damage then maybe we end up in this kind of like very tricky stalemate where we're both trading two card hands with one another and depending on the deck that might also be a game say that you're trying to manufacture but for me i'm trying to get to the point where i just take the last card out of their hand and then the next turn i just kill yeah and so i think like thinking about the game on the, the the second or third level and macro being able to do that and then tying that in together with the individual micro decisions like that's the the true skill that the top level flesh and blood players have right and i'm talking about it in absolute terms of uh you know numbers and mathematics but i think like a lot of good players do do this intuitively and some of them are really good at that calculus part the part where you're doing the percentages i think that's like a skill maybe that uh you know i kind of do the guesswork on okay um but then you know i i would say that i have a strength towards the third level which a third level doesn't mean harder necessarily or like a more complex thing but it's just like we're talking about like you know micro versus macro elements of gameplay and i think you have to be really good at all three to be the best player in the world which is like you know you mentioned michael hamilton i think he's an excellent player at all three of these levels for sure <clears throat> um it definitely is and it does it, it speaks to like I know we've played with who the best player in the world is like a lot lately on the channel, whether it's the tournament or the polls, and a lot of that is poking fun. And but uh, especially uh, Drood and Yuki Lee Bender on Twitter had an interaction where they had talked about how you know there's there are so many different ways to evaluate the best player in the world that it's really hard to put uh you know put a name on it and the you know the the easy thing to do is say michael hamilton's the best for for all the obvious reasons right and then pablo pintor but even i i threw out uh a friend of the channel uh chris ray uh who uh you know very prolific he's he is like the cal ripkin right of of uh of, of flesh and blood tournaments it feels like he's he's always there he's always consistent he's placing highly in all of them his elo is through the roof um all the time like it, he might have more uh, you know it just seems like he has more top eights than probably like anybody anywhere because he attends and plays so well in all of these events like just because you don't have the trophy uh in your hand from the pro tour but, you know but your your overall Right, score is through the roof. I, you might have, you know, your stats give you the opportunity there, and we're early enough where that, you know, very well may be the case. Um, Adam, I am curious to to know how your strengths weigh versus the heuristics that he presented uh, today. How how do you how how does your play kind of parallel uh, Frank's philosophy here? I, it's actually interesting because uh, you asked this question. I was kind of thinking about that as we we're talking here. And I think for me, the one thing I do really well is I'm very intuitive with doing that like damage calculation and like intuitively knowing if a hand is worth it or not. Um, it, it, to go back to Frank's conversation where he was talking with that other uh, fellow who shall not be named, and you know, he mentions how he's doing his damage calculation every turn and his friend goes oh you're doing that every turn and i i realize that you know there there are the turns where like the the math gets really tight and you're sitting there and you're counting okay my opponent's at 14 life and my hand or my, yeah my hand can deal 15 or 20 damage and so because it's you know this number is over the top of this number i can guess that i'm going to pull x amount of cards from my opponent's hand there are definitely the turns where I'm doing that very in-depth math, but there, I notice a lot of the time for myself, and maybe this is also something where, you know, I, I can learn from this conversation and and gather where, you know, the, those little micro percentages where maybe I'm not doing this enough and I, I should be doing it more, but 
I do feel on the whole, I can look at a hand and quickly go, oh yeah, this is a hand I want to keep because I've got this card and this card and I know that the damage multiplier is going to be through the roof. And so if I can hold on to this entire hand, I know that it's over the top damage to the point where my opponent can't deal with it. So a, in, a, in a long-winded way, I think that's kind of one of where my strengths lie and maybe why I'm more of an aggro player than anything else at this point in the the game. Um, I definitely know, like, yeah, level 2 and level 3 are places of what Frank mentioned where I, I could do stand to kind of level up a little bit more and it, it, things we're aware of and we're... With every game we play, we're always trying to be conscious of what can we work on and where can we, where could we have capitalized or improved in that game, you know, learning from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, uh, the one thing, too, that I'll point out is, uh, tie it back to what we were talking about earlier for practice, I think that the best way to do it is to do all of these calculations and actually do them. Uh, whether it's out loud or, you know, to like to your opponent, it like, doesn't matter if you're just playing a game, right? Like, it's not like it's for stakes or anything. Like, just do those calculations right, uh, right there and then every single turn in practice so that you kind of internalize that as best as you can. Then in a tournament setting, you don't have to use that overhead in your brain, basically, to do that calculation again. You can just get as close of a gist as you, as you need for the game state even if you don't do the math again. And, you know, I think like connecting that to the other two concepts would basically be if you have enough reps, you'll just, and I don't know, maybe that's like the brute force way of, of, of doing it is it's like you play enough game situations, you'll just know the last time you tried this one strategy, it worked. The last time you tried this strategy, it didn't work, whether you should or shouldn't do that. And I've heard really good players from other games basically talk about things in a similar way it's like yeah like you know somebody might not be the most uh intuitive chess player for you know really complex uh late games and stuff like that but they see enough of the late games that they could see the patterns in them and they said that okay well when i you know do this in a certain way it works so i'm just going to keep doing that now it, it's 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 actually kind of fun so we we just had uh we had Hamilton on and um, I, I can't speak highly enough of him, but he, he had, I posted it on, on the combat chain Twitter and obviously we can find it uh, on our interview of Michael Hamilton uh, a couple weeks ago on our YouTube, but he, he, he spoke on, you know, the, the factors that are, that make the great players, you know, who they are. And his, the big takeaway there was the, you know all the decision points in in an individual game if you can make a greater number of correct decisions than your opponent then your probability of winning can can go up and what i'm seeing here is the identification of the specific decisions that you can make in the game so we're we're learning here on the combat chain one great player at a time but it's 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 fun to see these these topics consistent and also expounded on uh in different players it's it's uh you can start to see the the um you can start to see what makes you know what makes a great play uh, a, a great player and and the the factors uh involved with that yeah and and you know maybe not to downplay my myself too much but i think like what separates me from some of the other guests that you're having on the show uh in terms of both performance but then also i think like their actual skill level as players is uh, definitely dedication to being a good player and competing like the good players are you know huge competitors and they don't mm -hmm. like they they love to win or they don't like to lose, whichever one of those you believe in more, I guess. Uh, but I think that, you know, having a really strong drive and turning these things that we talk about as concepts and heuristics and turning that into like an action 
you see, now we're going through the whole gamut, right? We've, we've basically gone from basics to now we're coaching a hypothetical player out there. Like if you want to be a professional, oh, I shouldn't say professional. If you want to be a high level trading card game player, how should you approach the grind? We're walking through you through the steps is mm-hmm. the intentionality and the uh, mechanics of what you need to do in practice. And then now we're talking about the last thing is you need the drive to actually just execute this consistently all yeah. the time. And that, and it speaks to, uh, again, right. Tying all the pieces together. We, uh, DM Armada and Tark Patel both from different sides speak on their individual time management as their strengths. DM, uh, using his time management, deciding to focus on the content side, Tarek focusing on the competition side, right? He is, he sets aside the the super, superfluous. Uh, I want to say it superfluous uh, things uh, out there, and then focusing his his time that he would have for those other things on to competitive flesh and blood. And DM Armada spoke on basically the opposite of that, where he could become a very good competitive player if he took that same time that he he dedicated to content and did it to practice, but chooses to to hold on to on to the content side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's kind of what I was trying to maybe get at too when I was talking yeah. about uh you know the different casters and how seriously they take it like dm armada must put like so much effort and mental energy and you know like appreciation right like for the game just into making content and Mm -hmm. you know i think uh as a as a forever kind of wandering soul maybe i i I feel like that holds me back a little bit from executing on some of these things, but I love to explore the ideas and uh, you know dip my fingers into to the the different pots. Frank, you you had you you talked about um you know the you know the value of cards, doing a damage output, and with, with the recent releases from Dynasty, there's there's been a lot of conversation about how some of these cards are a little lackluster in terms of like in terms of that math right they don't they don't fit the math as as well as they they likely should so i wanted to take a look at a couple of these and just kind of give give your your take on them and and kind of compare them versus you know some existing cards that may may be better in slot at the moment and kind of let's ex- explore that a little bit and see see what what can we do with these uh, these cards that have come in here? Um, the first one I want to talk about is the Merciless Battle Act. Uh, mm, yeah. That was spoiled a couple days ago. It is a warrior weapon, axe, two-handed weapon, which everyone, including me, super jazzed up about. I want to see want to see that that warrior with the axe. I want to use spill blood. I don't want to use the hatchets. Uh, really looking forward to a big two-handed axe weapon. Uh, its text says, once per turn action, pay three resources attack. Whenever Merciless Battle Axe attacks, if its attack is greater than twice its base, the attack gains overpower. Can't be defended, which is a keyword in bold. This can't be defended by more than one action card. And its base attack is three. And I think everything about that card sounds just nifty. And then you get to three attack and, you know, the question becomes... Uh, you know, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, that's. Let's just compare this to another three cost weapon. Uh, you know, the tried and true Anathos, tax for four on its own, and mm-hmm. it can go up to six if you pitch two cards. Ba- well, basically, it means you know, if you put two cards into it, you can deal six damage on your weapon instead of uh, just uh, four, right? And this mm-hmm. acts as another effect, but just like the raw damage, clearly below rate, uh, if we, whatever you want to call rate for weapons. You know, the rate mm-hmm. on weapons is kind of weird, uh, but it's less good than other options available in other classes. Even comparing to another warrior weapon, uh, the Dawn Blade attacks for three and comes in only, f- or it costs only one. So, is the effect worth 
basically a, either a two resource tax or a two or three power tax on the damage. And obviously the cop-out answer is to say it's not worth it. But I think actually my honest opinion is that, or sorry, the cop-out answer is to say we're not sure until we see more cards. Yeah. But my, yeah. my honest yeah. opinion is that I don't think it's worth it at all. Because I think the biggest scam in Welcome the Wraith, and sorry to all the Guardian fans out there, but the biggest scam in Welcome the Wraith is Bravo's Hero Power. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah? It's terrible. It says pay two resources to get blown out by a defense reaction. And this card says, when I have overpower, you can play as many defense reactions as you want. Against a class that historically has been very... You know, not countered necessarily, but the best play against them is to play more defense reactions in your deck. So, mm -hmm. on top of that, we're we're kind of I'm kind of assuming that there's a reason for your opponent to want to block, which is like already assuming a lot, right? Like evasion. Right. right. Has yeah, to you're, mean you're giving a lot of credit for the the unknown element of dynasty to this point, right? In order yeah. to give to to be positive about about the card. Yeah. Um. But, but keep going. Oh, I was gonna say, but if I don't want to block, then then I'm just paying two extra resources on this, similar to Dominate on Bravo. I'm paying two extra resources to not even add damage to it. I would actually rather it said, you know, well, I guess it wouldn't work for this case, but I'd rather it just be a three damage, or sorry, a three resource vanilla five damage with all of the other potential upsides if there's no reason that the opponent would want to block. Like having the evasion is only relevant either when you're threatening lethal and it's the end of the game, or if there's a benefit for you hitting. And of course, we've seen tons of warrior cards and effects that do benefit from hitting, so I'm not ruling it out at this point. And I'm not ruling out that the benefit would potentially be good. But, you know, it just seems like a really, really high uh, value tax that you're paying into it. And you know what? As, as far as card design, I think that's totally fine. I think LSS doesn't have to release a banger S tier weapon every single set for every single class. I think that weapons and cards and heroes exist to be in a continuum of playability. I just think that this is at the lower end of the playability intuitively, even oh. if uh, even if it, we get proven wrong by more cards, right? Which, which is like sure to happen. And I'm happy to be proven wrong because half the fun of speculating, right? Absolutely. Uh, speaking of which, what, uh, what would what would one card need to be in order to make this like worth it? My my initial thoughts when I saw this was that there either needs to be something like the a hero with an ability that discounts the price of it to put it back on rate. So, but mm -hmm. it only works right. It only works on two handed axes. So you get specific or something like that. Um, alternatively some sort of buff whether that's a reaction or a non-attack action that is super above rate in its efficiency like plus six for zero but only on two-handed axes to make it mm -hmm. you, you could make yeah. it a nine for three which puts it on par with some of the other uh some of the other attacks in the game that would cost uh similarly there but what, what are your what are your thoughts on on what kind well, of single card support this would need in order to get it back on track? I think if we're talking about single card support, and let, so let's just not, uh, I guess, consider like, you know, multiple rainbows making a deck work. So like single card support, I'm immediately thinking either heroes or equipment. Uh, so probably the easiest thing, I think, for this axe to be viable in some way is... Uh, Probably for a hero to both easily fulfill the condition, because if a condition's hard to fulfill, um, then you know it it just is less good. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, I think it has to have uh, an innate benefit from fulfilling the condition. Like whether it's extra damage, whether it's drawing extra cards, whether it's getting another hit in like Dorinthia does with her hero power or something along those lines. Like you have to get actual value out of your hero power. It can't just be this hero power is stitching together the skeleton of this deck. It has to be both helping you do the mechanics that the decks are designed for, and it has to 
give you benefits. And that's the difference between a hero power like Chain and a hero power like Leviah, where Leviah might stitch mm. together the hero. Mm. Or, you know, maybe I can't think of another good example off the top of my head. Or oh, Bolton, right? Like, yeah. charging stitches together the mechanics. But the payoff, extra action points actually for Bolton is a payoff, is not quite good enough for him to make up for the costs of the hoops that he has to jump through. Yep. Yep. Because uh, the inherent yeah. hoop, or sorry, I guess the hoop is clear on the card, but the, the carrot on the other side, or the, the, the prize, is not that good just on the card itself so the hero needs to contribute to the prize is what i think absolutely especially with how they've been been uh treating some of these heroes recently with that uh like that chain like right it is it, it, some sort of built-in advantage uh on on the card mm-hmm. um all right uh, we are running running a little behind so uh, i would love to go through all the things i do have one more card i want to talk to you about um mm-hmm. Reinforced Steel uh, is another one that has gotten a lot of kind of flack. It pairs with Season Savior and other sh- shields. Uh, we go into the... So the Season Savior is a, is a three block that comes in with a minus one counter uh, on there. And in fact, two. I'm just reading this now. I saw, thought I saw the one. Uh, it actually comes in with two minus one counters on it. Unbelievable. Uh, so it starts with a block one. Reinforced Steel removes a minus one counter from a Guardian offhand. You control with three or, lay, uh, three or less base uh, defense. Very on the nose. Feels very Planeswalker cardy. Uh, like, you know those Planeswalker decks where it's like you play this, you can go fetch a Teferi. Planeswalker. That's what I, that's the vibe I get from Reinforced Steel. Uh, but this one caught a lot of flack because uh, the basic, the premise is, well, why not just use Sigil of Solace, right? It, you, when we talk about the math of, of, of that card. But can we speak a little on on Reinforced Steel and its relationship to uh, to that damage in, into that value matrix, uh, especially when it comes to something like Season Savior here? Yeah, I think that the uh the main thing is if we look at a card like reinforced steel if you remove a minus one counter on something and then you immediately block with it again and you put the counter back onto it right away basically you've paid a whole card and two resources so let's just say two cards you paid two cards for one life doesn't sound very good and with a uh offhand since it's got to be guardian offhand we can't use it on the other armor pieces, unfortunately. An offhand like Stalagmite does give you a benefit when you need to block with it one more time. So let's say that you stop a Rosetta Thorn with your Stalagmite. You played the yellow one and you were able to stop uh, Rosetta Thorn an additional time with Stalagmite. You've now saved five life for two cards. I would say that is defensively, like for a defensive card, quite low for a not so flexible card to um be in your deck just like just for that sole purpose basically but if the floor case is five damage that might be acceptable if there's higher ceiling cases for the card if we're talking about stalagmite what if you could block with stalagmite every single turn and not lose those counters because you have a nerves of steel in play that suddenly goes from like you block with it a second time you block two rosetta thorns from blocking with the same stalagmite extra stalagmite counter because you've got a nerves to steal out suddenly that is you know 11 damage potentially that you can attribute to uh the benefit of reinforced steel now interesting thing i just said there are we attributing that extra five health to having played the reinforced steel or are we attributing it to the nerves of steel that we played uh this is also one of those tricky things like people say viscera makes Rosetta Thorn, a one for five, but then they also say that Revel and Rune Blood is a one for f- or a zero for five. It's like, okay, you can't count that Rune Chant in both of those piles, right? Like, that's not good accounting, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, sim- similarly, I think when we assess a card like Reinforced Steel, uh, I, I'm for right now, just in this example, we're talking about Reinforced Steel, I'm going to say that it added five life. So, suddenly we're blocking for 11, which is like great, right? If you're spending two cards to gain ele- like 11 value on two cards, insane, right? But, we have to pay the price of playing the Nerves of Steel somehow else in our deck. And there has to be a reason why we're doing that. So the best way I see Reinforced Steel and Nerves of Steel and other 
defensive guardian cards that they only have a function on defense. They don't have any flexibility. They're not easy to play in an offensive guardian deck. This is for like the ultimate stall deck. This is for the ultimate, maybe not stall, a little bit of a dirty word when you consider tournaments, but you know, this is the ultimate fatigue deck. This is to run your opponent out of threats. And some people might say it's unexciting to play against, but it's a strategy that is clearly being supported to some degree by LSS. And, you know, I, I said at the period of time when uh, Starvo is the best deck that I want to play the deck that's the most proactive. And if one day it means that Oldham is the most proactive deck because you're proactively disrupting at what everyone else is doing, then I want to be doing that. And so I think that it's possible for the fatigue deck to actually be the proactive deck in some instances because you're forcing other people to respect your play pattern and gameplay potential. And if they put enough support for this, like maybe there's a deck out there that literally is predicated around uh, not taking any damage when they have Nerves of Steel out to milk this extra reinforced steel counter over and over again, right? Because you're saving that mm -hmm. extra one life every single time you block with it for free. You're getting that extra... Uh, you know, uh, frostbite counter on them, which potentially can be turn ending. And is it convoluted in like a lot of hoops to jump through for like potentially low benefit in like our standard viewpoint of Guardian? Yes. But that's where it's exciting too for me because if every card just fit into regular Guardian, it would just be a worse version of a card that exists or a better version of a card that exists. If we only can compare things laterally, they're just like better or worse. This is exciting because it's like totally different. It's trying to do something that's totally different. It's trying to like establish a new game plan and archetype. So even though it looks like it sucks on paper because the math is bad and paying two re two cards, not just two resources, two cards to block one, it's actually like could mean a lot for a future archetype. So LSS hired me. I know game design. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Frank, this has been one of the I. I honestly didn't know what to expect coming into this. Uh, I expected a good conversation, but you really rocked my world here today. So thank you for coming on and and just I think I I think I actually did become a tangibly better player through this conversation. And for that, I thank you. Thank it's you, Pat, for having me on, and Adam. I think you became a tangibly better person, not just a player, for <laughs> having this poor, unfortunate soul on your on your podcast and listening to me talk. You know, it's like Make a Wish Foundation or something. No, <laughs> no, no, no. You you are uh, you are one of the uh, most respected members of the community, and you you're a breakout star. You you got that clout on on Twitch. You were streaming. And the whole world was talking about uh, about your job as the as the caster. And when stars break out like that, the combat chain scoops them right up, gets them on here. Got to give you a platform. And that's 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 what we're doing here. You you've earned the spot. No, I really, really, really appreciate it. I I do think, you know, I do think I want to continue to do casting and maybe not necessarily in pursuit of being a professional or you know, getting to the level of these other uh, content creators that we know and love, including the two of you. Uh, but I think like, just like for in the pursuit of fun and excitement, you know, it's like fun for me to experience and also fun for everybody else to just like see something different and see somebody just like come on and, you know, give a little bit of a curveball compared to what people are used to. So yeah, hopefully this is nothing like what people expected when they sign on for a combat chain podcast, right? Yeah, I tell you what, we're becoming we we early on we had our level up moments, and I like these interviews are getting just better, better, uh, better examples of of these level up moments than I think mm -hmm. we possibly could have. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. That's why you manufactured put, us ourselves. That's why you put Michael Hamilton before me because you had to level up to. Yeah, yeah. well, you yeah. know what? It lines. It really does line right up, and that's and that's the great thing. Like I had mentioned before, it's these the the ties that bind right? it, all these different uh, different parts of of that same right. Just 
competency and uh, not just uh, a virtuosity in the game, right? And how each individual player kind of, uh, approaches that approach, uh, 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 <laughs> approaches like their at their their ways of getting getting to that to that point to that pinnacle of of what uh you know a great player is and then it really is consistent throughout and you can you can see how all of these uh, all the all the, the different emphasis that these players have and how they actually are very much still within the same core philosophy of just how you value the game and and how much you invest your your time and you know your your mind space into mm-hmm. what you're doing here and being able to identify those those processes that you are you know the the good intuitive players are are doing but might not be able to put a name to it and that's right th- that level up in itself is is being able to identify oh yeah i'm i see that i have a good hand and i'm playing it because i know it's good the level up is knowing that I know that this hand is good because it produces 18 points of damage with this setup. And I understand that I have a force multiplier here and its base value is actually 13. So I'm, you know, it is a much more efficient turn to play all of these cards than, as you said, lose one to a block somewhere down the line because I will lose much more damage than I will gain in life by by losing that card uh and mm. uh it's uh yeah i don't it goes that's that's i'm gonna just meander off with that adam can you do me a favor i am done can you can you can you send us out with the plugs and uh uh make sure frank gets his space for the plug as well yeah uh yeah totally uh... <laughs> just i just uh, can I stick a fork in me Okay. All right. Well done. Frank, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, We really appreciate your insight, um, your wealth of knowledge, man. Uh, Quickly, do you have any plugs, anything you want to um, put out there? This is is your opportunity to kind of say whatever. Yeah, definitely. I guess for uh, maybe shout outs for the uh, core testing group and friends that you know i've been playing flesh and blood with for the past couple of months in cloud central station uh and also the ludicolo farm and then people can find me on twitter at the lazy dog except it's spelled with an e instead of a y for lazy because somebody had taken the lazy dog and i don't think they've tweeted in a million years oh um classic and Honestly, I'm not even going to shout out the YouTube channel, even though it exists. Uh, <laughs> or like, you know, I'm not going to give the link to that, but it's out there. You may stumble upon it one day. You can ask me personally if you would like to see a video of me eating local Korean fried chicken or a hot dog. And both of those meals are great, by the way. So there you go. Right on. Uh, on our end, uh, our plugs quickly. Uh, you can find us uh, on YouTube. Uh, youtube.com forward slash uh, the combat chain we're also on twitter uh at uh the combat chain uh you can find uh, myself at farm toolery tcg and you can find pat at pat smash good uh, and i think i forgot to mention that we are on um as well as youtube on every um podcast streaming platform uh to my knowledge we're on all of them uh I don't even know how many there are now. I think the, the list is ever expanding. I know we are on... There is, there's too many. There's too many. But we're on all of them. We, yeah. Well, we'll go with that. We're on all of them. Uh, I'm just... <laughs> is there anything I'm forgetting? Uh, Pat putting me on the spot here, and I'm trying to make sure I'm I got sorry, it all. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, no, I think, that's, I think that does it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, we do have one last order of business. Uh, Frank, uh, we close out the podcast in a, a very special way that we'd like to get you involved in. Um, I will say uh, until next week, and then in unison, we will all say we're closing the combat chain. Cool. Okay, that sounds good. 
cool 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 uh so thank you everyone for uh listening this is episode is this i think this is episode 30 actually i can't believe we made it to 30 30 uh super exciting but uh yeah thank you everybody for listening uh until next week we're We're closing closing the the combat combat chain. chain And then I'm going to activate Spellbound Creepers so that I can play a non-attack action. Yeah. Let's go again <laughs> and gain another action point. You tricky Thank bugger. You. Oh, that's a, good, that's a good little end piece to it.